Hello, Mr. Natural here. Well, today we're going to start a new series, uh, which will be eventually turned into a playlist. Just as I did with intervals, so you could learn to read by number and get those ideas in your eyeball, today we're going to do the same thing essentially with rhythm. And I have a little trick that I've used down through the years to help you hear rhythms and then be able to actually write them out. So you can listen to someone performing and write out in real time as they're performing, notate the rhythms that they're, that they're performing. Uh, in order to be able to hear something like this, it just doesn't work to use teaching rhythm the way it's taught right now as fractions. Uh, teaching someone 1 8th, 1 16th, 1 32nd, 1 64th, etc., etc. It's a concept, very good, conceptually nice, you can do all kinds of fascinating and fantastic things with it. The problem is four, five, six, seven, eight-year-olds can't understand it. You see, children do not learn fractions or fractional thinking, pieces of a pie, half a pie, quarter of a pie, until they get into fifth or sixth grade. And so before fifth or sixth grade, we have this issue. How do you teach kids, a four-year-old, a five-year-old, how to read rhythm? It's always been done by rote. And then the problem is, they can read the rhythm on the page, and they can perform it, but they can't actually hear it, and they can't write it down. They have no intellectual control over what it is they're hearing. They have no uh, ability to make it aware. So down through the years, uh, there have been tricks that jazz musicians have been using for centuries now, actually going all the way back to early classical music, and it's a thing that... I call code words. Now I first learned the idea of code words from a piano tuner back in the 60s when I was working with William Russo, the great uh, Chicago jazz musician who studied composition with Charles Ives. And because he studied composition with Charles Ives, he was extremely good at writing out everything and notating it all beautifully and writing gorgeous scripts. And he worked with, uh, back in the 40s, he was a young trombone player who worked with Stan Kenton. He was in Stan Kenton's band. And if you go all the way back to like 1944, you'll see a record that they put out called New Concepts, in which Stan Kenton was uh, kind of pushing a new kind of jazz known as progressive jazz. And all, most of those compositions on that record, New Concepts, if you look at the back, most of them were composed by Bill Russo. However, he didn't compose it the way that most uh, jazz musicians do, which was by humming the tune or working it out or showing it on the keyboard. He wrote everything out with music notation because of his study with Charles. Um, Charles Ives, if you don't know about classical music, go look him up. He was probably one of the greatest scripters of all time. He would take not just an orchestra or a chorus, he would have multiple orchestras, multiple courses, and a lot of the things that he wrote is what we would really truly call multimedia. He managed to take uh, two orchestras and have two completely different melodies going on at the same time and harmonize them and have them being played almost independently of each other simultaneously. And Charles was famous for writing multiple, multiple, multiple melodies and parts simultaneously in which the performer had to play what was in front of them as cautiously as possible because you couldn't get any musical cues listening to the rest of the groups that are out there because they might be playing something completely different. Well, Bill learned and studied from Charles and uh, had gorgeous, gorgeous handwriting, musical handwriting. If you get any of his books, uh, his book on jazz composition, for instance, You'll see throughout the book uh, handwritten examples uh, that he's talking about in the book, and they're all written by Bill. Gorgeous handwriting. Gorgeous. Um, code words. What code words do is code words allow us to take a rhythm and notate this rhythm as a vocal, as a vocal riff. And this comes back, all the way back, as far back in history as we can go, to a thing known as poetry. And in poetry in the 14th, 15th, 16th century, around the time of Shakespeare, it was very common for people to write poetry using a rhythm scheme uh, known as iambic pentameter, which is kind of like Humpty Dumpty, Humpty Dumpty, Humpty Dumpty, Humpty Dumpty, Humpty Dumpty, Boom, 
Humpty Dumpty, right? And they would find words that fit these rhythms, and they would find words that rhyme that they could put at the end of each sentence or every other sentence, or put at the beginning of the sentences, doing what we call end-line rhyme or front-line rhyme, or occasionally what's called tail-eating, where the end of one thing, poem, rhymed with the beginning of another poem, etc. And these simple rhyme schemes and these simple form have been used throughout history by poets in order to generate interesting rhythms. And I have discovered that using language and to create natural sounding rhythms is the best way to teach someone how to actually hear the rhythm and eventually be able to notate and write it down. But you have to associate the rhythm of a specific word with an icon, with the musical icon. What, mu what word generates quarter notes? What word generates eighth notes? What word generates sixteenth notes, etc. And then by using these words and compounding and putting them together and making up little nonsense poems or little nonsense rhyme schemes, these are a way that musicians have memorized rhythm. Now, why would they do this? There is a big difference between the beat, the pulse, and what's called a groove. The beat, for instance, in music we use what's called 4-4, four, four, and we have four beats in each measure. So it's counted one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. And often we tap our foot or our hand, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. That's the beat. Within the beat, you can subdivide the beat into pulses. Pulse, like the pulse of your wrist. I hear my heartbeat. Thump, boom. Thump, boom. Thump, boom. Thump, boom. Can't think of a word. Thump, boom. Pulse. Beats can be divided into pulses. That is equivalent to what we would refer to as syllables. If I have a four-syllable word, that four-syllable word, for instance, like terminator, 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 four-syllable word, and that's generating the rhythm, terminator, terminator, terminator. Now, some words also will put an accent, terminator, 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 terminator. And we do that in music as well. Or I can go terminator, 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 or terminator, 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 terminator. And by changing the accent on the syllable, I can adjust the pulse within that beat to express emotionally anything I want. And it's as easy as running the, running the word through your head. Because we've been speaking words and we've been speaking rhythms for such a long, long time. Now, back in 1960s, I met a piano tuner at a place called the Chicago Free Theater, which was an organization that Bill Russo had put together. He was teaching at that time at Columbia College, I believe, in Chicago, and he was also doing, getting his master's degree, I believe, in English at that time, studying English, and he came up with this idea of improvisational theater, and he put together a company which was beginning to do improvisational theater events throughout Chicago and they were doing things like going into abandoned bowling alleys and having this team of people that he had created in this theater to come together and do improvised music and improvised acting and improvised motion and dance and that eventually became the, the Chicago Free Theater. The Chicago Free Theater bought a building uh, in Chicago and began a four-story building and began to build and get bigger and bigger and bigger until finally it became a very well-known music school. And I was lucky enough to have met Bill back at that time in work. Now he had tons of pianos in all the various rooms there and there was a piano tuner who used to come in and tune the pianos. And he was a very interesting man and I was interested in tuning and he was actually a person who gifted me with my first tuning wrench so I could learn to tune pianos, and he started giving me advice about tuning. And he explained to me that when you're tuning pianos, we tune them to perfect fourths and fifths, 
and then we flatten the fifths and we stretch the fourths in order to get this thing called equal temper tuning that we have. We don't use perfect fourths, we don't use perfect fifths as we do when we tune violins or non-fretted instruments are usually tuned to perfect intervals. But on um, <clears throat> the piano keyboards, guitars, instruments that are fretted, they, we use what's called a well-tempered or equal-tempered uh, sy uh, system of tuning. And then by doing that, what we have to do is make the perfect fifth just a little bit shorter or flatter and take the fourth, which is the inversion of the fifth, and it stretches it. And if we stretch it by three beats in five seconds, three beats in five seconds, what we're doing is adjust off, misadjusting to, in it, it, to open up to this new type of tuning known as equal tuning, equal temperament. And what happened is, as you're doing this tuning and you're, you're doing what they call laying the bearings, which is doing up, fourth, down, five, up, four, down, five, or up, four, down, five, et cetera, et cetera, until you get the first 12 notes in there set. Then what you want to do is you want to check certain intervals or distances between certain notes and listen for the number of warbles or beats that we can hear in the overtones clashing with each other. And these warbles or beats can happen with an exact timing that you can watch a clock and say, okay, Three beats in five seconds will give me the mistuning that I need to make this piano correct. We can check it by checking what are known as major thirds and minor thirds. And what a pianist will do after he lays the bearing is he'll check, say, C to E and C to E flat. And what they'll be listening for is the number of warbles or beats, these blooms that you can hear above the fundamentals as the overtones interact and clash with each other. And these beats for major, for the major third, the number of beats should be 10 beats in one second. And for a minor third, it should be between 14 and 15 beats in one second. Now, how can a person hear the difference between 10 beats in one second and 14 beats in one second was the question that came up. And the piano tuner said to me, we use a mnemonic code. We use a word that generates a rhythm that will put out 10 pulses. And when we listen to these 10 pulses and subdivide those 10 pulses into one second, we'll get exactly the number of beats we should expect to hear if that interval's in tune. So you can go to your piano, try C and E, listen carefully, and you'll hear these warbles, and the warbles will be going, Bleh. and then you try a, the C and the E flat, and they'll go Bleh, faster. And to be able to count those, you can imagine, you can hear them, anyone can hear them, but imagine trying to count those. So here was his trick. His trick was the word Mississippi had four syllables, and if you say mud, you have Mississippi mud, Mississippi mud, five syllables. If I say Mississippi really fast, Mississippi, 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 I can start to say it so fast that I begin to mumble, but in my mind, I can keep those five divisions absolutely perfect. So I can say Mississippi, 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 mud, Mississippi, mud, Mississippi, mud, Mississippi, mud, Mississippi, mud. And what I'm generating is one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, five, one, two, Mississippi, mud, Mississippi, mud, Mississippi, mud, Mississippi. And if I go faster and faster, Mississippi, mud, Mississippi, in my head I go Mississippi, mud, I can do it faster in my mind than I can verbally speak it. If in one second you say Mississippi, mud, Mississippi, mud twice, that's 10. 5 plus 5, 10, right? So Mississippi, 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 and I'm doing 10 pulses per second. If you slow that down and count all the little loads I'm doing, you'll hear there's exactly 10. Now, what about 14? If I say Mississippi Mud Terminator, Mississippi Mud Terminator, Mississippi Mud Terminator, Mississippi Mud Terminator. So I go Mississippi Mud, Mississippi Mud Terminator, Mississippi Mud, Mississippi Mud Terminator, Mississippi Mud, Mississippi Mud Terminator, Mississippi Mud, Mississippi Mud Terminator. And in my head, I'm going 14. Mississippi Mud, Mississippi Mud. And I can do this almost at the speed of light. 
as fast as I can think. I can speed this up or slow it down and always have exactly 14 divisions, no matter what speed I'm going at. Or say Mississippi Mug twice and get exactly 10 divisions, no matter how fast or how slow. And in my mind, I can speed it up, speed it up faster than I can vocalize or sub-vocalize it. And if I can do that two Mississippi Mugs in one second exactly, I will get exactly 10 beats per second, which is what that major third should be tuned to. I can then listen to the minor third, say Mississippi Mud, Mississippi Mud Terminator, Mississippi Mud, Mississippi Mud Terminator, Mississippi, uh, term, or Mississippi Mud, Mississippi Diatonic, Mississippi Mud, Mississippi Diatonic, Mississippi Mud Diatonic. Anything in which you're going Mississippi Mud, Mississippi Mud, there's your 10, and then a four syllable word, Terminator, you know, Diatonic, Alligator, whatever. Any four letter word in which it goes like this without much of an accent. Okay. So this is the idea behind code words. I learned that you can speed up and slow down rhythm. You can play rhythm as robotically as you want. By roboto, I mean speed it up or slow it down as you're going and put as much emotional content into what you're doing and still hold the rhythm true. So the difference between a beat and pulses is there is a groove and everybody wants to play with the groove and the way you get comfortable with rhythm to be able to play it with the groove is we use code words now the advantage to this of course is if we know exactly how many syllables there are and we attach it to an icon like a graphic of of uh, like a graphic of a note for instance here we have the note the this is the quarter note and the quarter note, we just use the word drum. Drum. If I want two pulses in one beat, then I just simply use the word Tarzan. Tarzan, Tarzan, Tarzan. Gives me two pulses in one beat. If I need three divisions, I can say elephant, elephant, or triple it, triple it. Triple it, triple it, triple it, triple it. Or elephant, elephant, elephant. Harmony, 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 harmony. All three letter words which generate three pulses in the beat. If in one beat I want four, I use alligator or terminator. Terminator, terminator. Or I could say diatonic, 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 diatonic. Alligator, terminator, terminator. All those words work. Now what you do is you start to develop your own set of code words. And I've written down here a few examples of ones that have become quite popular and are around out there all the time. So, again, code words. If we do Mississippi Mud, we're getting five pulses. If I say Mississippi Mud twice, I get ten pulses. If I say Mississippi, Mississippi, and then add a four-letter word like diatonic onto that, Mississippi, Mississippi, diatonic, I got 14 pulses in one beat. And I can speed that beat up, I can slow that beat down, and keep those pulsed subdivisions absolutely perfect. Because our subconscious mind is capable of rescaling things automatically. It's one of the normal functions of our body. Now... <coughs> <clears throat> when Bill Russo did the Chicago Free Theater back in 1964 till the mid-70s, he used these code words. The code word he used for one pulse per second was one. So quarter notes were one, 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 one. <clears throat> to get two divisions within one beat, he used the word number, number, number. So if we put them together, one pulse, one, 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 one. And in the same time, I say the word number, 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 one, one, number, one, number, one, number, 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 one. And you can see what's happening is rhythms are beginning to get generated. The last one he used for four was diatonic, diatonic, diatonic. So he used one number triplet for three subdivisions and diatonic. 
I'm just pulling out the even ones because we're going to start with those. We'll do the odd ones late. We'll use triplets and elephant and those things later. Um, uh, one of my friends who is, uh, for many, many years, was goth. She used to dress in black, you know, and have the red, red lips or the black lips and do the whole thing and dress up in her goth makeup. And she said, I don't like those code words. So she made up her own code words. So I call these the goth code words, which I find kind of interesting. She used the word blood, blood. Blood, blood. For two pulses, she used heartbeat, heartbeat, blood, heartbeat, blood, heartbeat, heartbeat, blood. See how beautifully that works, okay? For this, she used terminator, terminator for four. Terminator, heartbeat, blood, blood. Terminator, heartbeat, terminator, blood, blood, heartbeat, blood. Heartbeat, Terminator, heartbeat, Terminator, blood. Works quite well. And it was very, very, rather goth. You'll see later what we're going to be able to do is take part of the two pulses and part of the four pulses, take the first half of the two and put it on the back half of the four. Take the first half of the four and put it on the back half of the two and generate what we call a compound code word. Some compound code words work better than others. In Australia, somewhere around the late 70s, early 80s, a nun, an Australian nun, I can't remember her name right now, but you can find it online, she decided to do something with all animal names to teach children. She came up with the same concept. And she used the word dog, monkey, and alligator. Dog, monkey, elephant, and alligator. Dog, monkey, elephant, alligator. Myself, back in the late 70s, I think uh, Walt Disney came out with a cartoon known as Tarzan, and my, my uh, lady at the time, Angel, and I had a child, Solen, our daughter Solem, and we went to take her to see that. And while we were seeing that, we noticed we wanted to do something with a jungle theme. Instead of all animals, we wanted to do jungle theme. So our code word became drum, drum, drum. Tarzan, Tarzan, drum, Tarzan, alligator, Tarzan, alligator, drum, and we also use elephant for the triplet. So we use half animals and half. And I'll explain to you later on why we use Tarzan instead of monkey, because monkey and alligator cannot be compounded together easily to make a rhythm that's tripping off the tongue. But Tarzan and alligator go very well together. So I'm going to use these code words, drum, Tarzan, and alligator in this series. And you can make up any code words that you want. Now what I suggest is if you speak a foreign language as your first language, you speak Spanish or you speak Russian or you speak Portuguese or any other language which is your first language, instead of English, find words in that language. There are words in the French. A friend of mine is French. He found words in the French um, language which had exactly those natural rhythms and allowed him to compound these words, use half of one word and half of another word to compound them into all these other words. And he uses these French words. And what he did is every time we would do code word training, he would replace them with his words and he would practice the words that he had until he became very comfortable at it. Now it's very common for old jazz musicians, you'll hear them say dibbity dibbity do or bippity bobbity boo. Bibbity bobbity bibbity bobbity bibbity bobbity boo. That's Disney doing code words, right? Um, or you'll hear people say ba 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 da ba boom or binga ba binga bomb binga bomb boom binga bomb binga. They just make up scat words. Diddly bop, diddly bop, diddly bop, bop. Diddly bop, diddly bop, diddly bop, bop. Uh, Willie Matea online has his own little code words that he's used. And he has these little things that he discovered in college that helped him get through these things. Why would people use the code words instead of writing out the rhythms as fractions and reading them and just performing them? Because you can get a groove. The difference between a beat, pulses, and a groove is a groove allows me to put as much emotional content onto the rhythm as I can. 
I can move accents around on various syllables. I can speed it up and slow it down. I can cut it off. I can think in my head certain uh, code words and say out loud with my instrument other parts of a code word. So I can take words like alligator, for instance, and what would it be if I only used the first syllable and the last syllable? Al, gator, al, tur, al, gate, al, tor, al, tor. We can use, we can think al, tor, al, tor. I can think of the center part in my brain subconsciously and only play the outside edges and get very complicated rhythms that would be very, very difficult to play them smoothly and to have a groove with them. So the whole point of code words is to have a groove, to be able to play these things in a way in which they're so fluid that you can speed up, slow down, or add as much uh, emotional nuance into the rhythms and bring the rhythms, instead of being dead and ah, 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 I can make them ah, 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 ah. I can put some groove into it. And I can do this without interfering with what I'm reading on the thing. I can read those little dots going across there and I can figure out a code words or a set of code words which I can put together as sort of a nonsense sentence and I can say that sentence in my head at any speed I want to with any accent on any syllable that I wish to I can change it around as I'm doing it and continue this flow this rhythmic flow without interruption and get what's known as a groove learning to groove with the rhythm is the most important thing. Putting emotional content on what you're doing is more important than the notes themselves. Okay. So that's why I'm doing what I'm doing. I've explained what code words are. I've explained why they're superior using them as rhythmic, as rhythmic tools because of the ability to groove with them, the ability to change them on the fly. And there's a long tradition now, a lot of people uh, object to hip-hop music. Well, you're just silly. Hip-hop is essentially poetry. And it is using these rhythms, these natural rhythms in the language, which have been around since the early pyramids. So, folks, if you don't like hip-hop, you don't like poetry. And if you don't like poetry, you don't like everything that humanity has done from the time we built pyramids until today. Okay? So get with it, listen to it in a different way. Try to get the groove behind what's going on. My job is to teach you how to see these little symbols and to take these little symbols and put them together to make rhythms. Tars and alligator, tars and alligator, and be able to use those code words to be able to hear consciously what's going on and how to notate or write that down on a piece of paper. And my goal here is to ear train you into being able to read these rhythms on a piece of paper comfortably without interfering with the groove of it. And my job is to help you learn how to write down these ideas without stopping your brain to think about it so you can write out rhythms that you're hearing in real time. It's what composers do. They get an idea in their mind, and then they have to organize it rhythmically, and then write out the rhythms on a piece of paper. Now, the only thing that we add to that is we push them up or down in a musical staff called a scale. We go up and down in the scale, and by moving up and down in the scale, we use intervals to decide what the scale is, and we play those interval patterns using these rhythms, and we have what's called music, okay? And that music can be expressed with emotions, with feelings, with a groove, which is the most important thing. So I'm going to stop this right now and then give you a quick lesson where I'm just going to play with this idea to see if I can get your ear tantalized into it. Some of you will be able to catch on to it, bam, right away. You'll, get, you'll catch it in a few minutes. I've been able to do code word education with classes in colleges and various other places and in less than 20 seconds, some people got it and they're already, they just have to learn how to write it out and they're already writing it out. Other people, it takes weeks to do this. So don't be discouraged. 
I'm going to use this little guy behind me, a, a metronome, and we're going to use the metronome to give us our basic beat. Then we're going to use the code words to subdivide it into pulses, and then we're going to put code words together to create more complicated rhythms. What we're going to do is start with just two code words. First code word we'll use is drum, and the second code word that I will use is Tarzan. And you will see those two code words alone are more than 60% of all written music. You can open up any score anywhere, and it's mostly made of eighth notes and quarter notes. So being able to hear the eighth notes and quarter notes would be a big advantage in being able to read, a big advantage in being able to start to compose by using what we call isorhythms. We develop a couple of code words that we put together and we build a little lick and we take that little lick and we turn that lick into a motive and we turn that motive into a larger theme and we turn it into a sentence and the sentence into a paragraph and before long you've got a symphony. It's just that simple. All right, good day and we'll start this right now.